Okay, so it's more or less two o'clock. Um, so Hitoshi, you're ready to go, are you? Yep. Yeah, I am. Okay, so well, thank you very much for making a contribution. Um, it's very exciting to get you to give a talk. Um, and uh, yeah, it's always interesting to have some well-known uh, physicists who have uh, very broad knowledge. Um, okay, so I, would, I just want to introduce our speaker, Hitoshi, who's basically going to tell us about dark energy and dark matter in the with the Subaru telescope. So I start? I guess, yes. All right. So thank you so much for the invitation. And uh, I've never been to poor hands so far. So hopefully I'll find an opportunity something in the future once the pand pandemic is over. But anyway, so I was invited to give a talk in this Dark Energy in the Dark Age lecture series. And looking at some of the past talks, it's actually rather heavily oriented towards observational cosmology, seemed to me. So I, I try to put some aspect of that too, but I come from the particle phys uh, uh, the phenomenology background, and I uh, touch on sort of particle uh, physics uh, aspect in many ways as well. So hopefully uh, uh, you, you see something you might like, uh, uh, whatever your background may be. So that's my hope. Okay, so uh, I will be talking about dark energy and dark matter with super telescope. And of course, everybody is familiar with a plot like this, looking at the composition of the energy density in the universe today. And the, uh, the, the fact of the matter is, it's the biggest portion, 69% uh, is dark energy that's apparently accelerating expansion of the universe. We don't know what it is. Could be cosmological constant, could be quintessence. And 26% uh, of the universe is dark matter. Again, we don't know what it is. We know it, uh, it exists. It's, it's played many important, very important roles in uh, forming the structure of the universe today, but we don't know what it is. And the most of us think that we understand 5% of the universe, but we actually don't, because we don't know why baryons exist. Because the universe started out with, presumably with inflation, that turned inflationary energy into the thermal bath, thereby creating the equal amount of baryons and antibaryons, or matter and antimatter. Why didn't they annihilate away? So we actually don't know this either. So I try to touch on all three subjects today. So let me start with dark matter and then go to the visible matter and finally dark energy. So that's the plan today. And the one thing that comes in in a very big way in my talk is a Subaru telescope. It's a very special telescope, has a big aperture of 8.2 meter, meter mirror, one of the largest telescope in the world. And that's why you can actually observe very deep into the universe. And so the Subaru is actually here, not the biggest like Keck is, but at least among the largest in the world. And looking at this uh, eight meter class telescopes uh, in the world and look at their uh, uh, the field of view, it actually has the largest field of view by far, which I'm gonna show you on the next slide. So the, this telescope is very special in the sense that it can observe both deep and wide. And it's also sitting on an excellent site atop Mauna Kea on the big island of Hawaii. So that routinely we get seeing at the level of 0.5 arc seconds or so. Uh, compared to like uh, uh, many other telescopes, it's actually excellent. And just to emphasize this point about the field of view, so this is the size of the field of view compared to the size of the full moon among all the other eight meter scale telescopes. And this is a field of view of Subaru telescope. So the survey power is amazing. And once LSD comes online, then LSD would have three times a more a field of view than Subaru does, but still, you know, in in in, in the same league. So uh, this is a, it's really one of the strength of the, the Subaru telescope. And to make uh, a use of this uh, uh, incredible field of view, one of the things we have done already to build a new humongous camera called Hyper Suprime Cam. Suprime actually stands for Subaru Prime Focus Point Camera. And so the fact that most eight meter telescopes don't accept any instruments that prime focus because uh, the instruments tend to be heavy and the structure is not built to actually uh, uh, stand up against that weight. The Subaru has been built very, very robustly. So it can accept a, uh, a heavy instrument at a prime focus point, which is exactly why it has such a large field of view. And so this camera we really built uh, is now undergoing a 330 night survey and has five filters, G-R-I-Z-Y, and with six narrowband filters. And uh, one of the things I'm uh, most interested in is the white survey that will cover 1400 square degrees. And in terms of survey power, that's about in, on, in par with the, the dark energy survey, DES, led by the US groups. And so this is the, uh, shows the wavelength coverage of five filters. 
And this is the size of the white food correctal lens system. The lens system by itself is one, meter, one, one and a half meters high. And if you put that together into a camera, the whole thing is now three meters high, weighs three tons, so, and has nearly a billion pixels. This is one of the first pictures we took with a Subaru uh, Hypercher Prime Cam HSC. You can see this andromeda. And because a large field of view, you can capture this image in one shot, which is really amazing. And a bunch of other uh, 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 pictures here. And uh, the, this is actually a deep exposure of the cosmos field. And you can appreciate how deep this image is because, you know, it's galaxies everywhere. And if you actually uh, zoom it up, thanks to the spinning pixels, uh, you, you still see very uh, images very clearly. And you can also see that for nearby galaxies, they come completely overlapping with the faraway galaxies because of this very high number density of objects you can see because of this uh, large aperture and a very deep image. And also you can also appreciate a very excellent seeing uh, in this image. So by using that, what can we do about dark matter? Well, this is already a, uh, uh, the image we have taken with a Subaru using weak lensing survey. And, and this is actually a 2D map of galaxies, this is typo, I'm sorry. And here's a 3D map of dark matter by looking at the photometric uh, uh, redshift. And so we can actually map out the three dimensional distributions of dark matter using Subaru telescope. And redshift goes all the way from 0.1 to about one. And, and so this is actually the world's biggest 3D map of dark matter that exists today. And you can clearly see the correlation between dark matter distribution and a galaxy distribution. You can also see that the structure was not as prominent at high redshift, namely in the past. It starts to grow towards uh, the recent, namely, uh, so this is a structure growth. And so you can actually see that uh, aspect as well. So this is uh, one of the things Subaru has done already. And looking at the cosmic shear, that also uh, allows us to determine omega matter and uh, sigma eight, or in this particular combination, to orthogonalize the uh, error bars uh, for the two parameters. And it's interesting that the Subaru measurement, first of all, is consistent with other weak lensing surveys, DES and KITS, uh, but there is some tension with the CMB measurements from Planck. So how this will play out in the future is something we want to watch for. So uh, the, this is another way of determining omega matter. Of course, that's the, mostly uh, the matter of the, uh, the component of dark matter. So uh, that, that's relevant to dark matter question as well. But one of the things I'd like to talk about is, is something which is much more closer to particle physics. So the particle physicists, even before I actually got into grad school, have sort of been sold to this idea or paradigm of weakening interacting massive particles or WIMPs. So the idea is that the, these are elementary particles that existed at the early universe when the temperature was higher than their masses so that they could be produced thermally. But at one point they start to annihilate uh, into the standard model particles. So, so they start to reduce their number densities, the moving number densities. Uh, but what, at one point, the, the dark matter distribution becomes so sparse, so dilute, and they stop seeing each other, annihilation process stops, and that's what is called a thermal freeze out. And that you can estimate based on a simple uh, dimensional analysis or a typical annihilation cross-section we know among elementary particles like E plus E minus annihilation to gamma gamma. And so typical coupling size of let's say fine structure constant, you put that into the estimate of the cross-section and then to get the right amount of dark matter at the end of the day, you conclude that the mass scale for dark matter turns out to be about 300 GeV, 1 TeV-ish kind of energy scale. And because of this long-standing uh, paradigm that uh, we do need new physics at the electroweak scale uh, from 300 to 1 TeV energy scale to solve the naturalness problem as associated with the Higgs boson because of its quadratic division, so sometimes it's also called hierarchy problem. We wanted to have extra particles in this mass scale anyway. And so the idea that uh, this estimate came out to be bang on the same energy scale was considered to be quote unquote miracle, quote mi mi miracle. So the kind of, cross, uh, kind of coupling similar to weak interaction and kind of energy scale similar to weak interaction happens to give you the correct abundance of dark matter. And this is how it became this basically the main paradigm in, in, from the particle physics point of view about the nature of dark matter. And if that's true, there are many ways we can prove this experimentally. So dark matter still exists in the halo today. So maybe they undergo the same kind of annihilation process they did at the freeze out so that you can see the standard model particles spewing out 
like the gamma waves E plus E minus and, and antiprotons and so on. So that's an indirect detection of dark matter. If you take this diagram this way, then this is a scattering process of dark matter coming in, hits a standard model particle and, and uh, uh, gives some energy deposit. And that's what people have been doing underground uh, uh, in, in looking for dark matter direct detection. And Korea is known to host uh, many important experiments, CHEMS, for example, uh, in this area. area. And finally, you can use this diagram backwards, starting from standard model particles like protons and A plus E minus, and, and pair create dark matter particles in accelerators. And that's what AOSC has been doing uh, already for more than a decade. So, so all these efforts have been going on, but unfortunately, we don't see any signal of that. So the top left panel is the LHC limit on looking for something that's a missing energy uh, in the proton-proton uh, collision. And top white diagram shows the limit coming from the, uh, uh, the direct detection experiment underground. And there's a famous neutrino floor where the atmospheric neutrinos, the solar neutrinos, would constitute the major background to dark matter such. So we're looking at incredibly small cross sections you can see here. Uh, there's still room to go, but it's already narrowing down. So uh, the direct detection experiment would eventually hit the limit of uh, it's very, very difficult to improve upon. And so, uh, and, and uh, we are not there yet, but nonetheless, we haven't seen any signal there. And uh, uh, the fourth panel here is, uh, uh, the, uh, again, the LHC experiment looking for specifically uh, a particular new physics model, in this case, supersymmetry and Gluino searches. Again, the limit just keeps getting better and better. And finally, this is the limit coming from indirect detection. This is one of the rather ambitious analysis uh, that came out this year. And so you conclude, if you take this at a face value, that the dark matter mass below 300 GeV is already excluded by the indirect detection of gamma rays coming from galactic center. So we have, we have used all these three different methods in looking for the dark matter in, in the form of WIMPs, and we still don't see any signals of that. So that's a very unfortunate situation. So uh, the community is now undergoing sort of a transition or soul searching uh, to look for much more broadly about what dark matter may be. So if you look at this incredible large log scale of the mass of the dark matter, at least we can uh, exclude the two ends of this by looking for, for example, primordial black holes by uh, using microlensing effects and also looking for fuzzy dark matter where the dark matter has the debris wavelength, which may not fit inside the size of the galaxy, then it wouldn't play the role of being dark matter to hold the galaxies together. So this range is excluded, for example, using Lyman alpha constraints. And in between, we, already, we still have something like 75 orders of magnitude of possibilities. In principle, it can be anywhere within the 75 orders of magnitude. We have no clue. So we've been looking for WIMPs as a candidate, prime candidate for dark matter, but there has been always like a, this tiny range uh, on this uh, huge orders of magnitude of the possibilities. And there are many candidates we haven't really looked for very seriously, like cue balls, this kind of solid on solution to scalar field theory. Uh, the, the prime version of this is the scalar quarks. Uh, you can produce these very heavy particles below Planck scale using preheating after the inflation, sometimes called wimp zealous. QCD axion is sort of back in vogue, and there's an extensive effort in Korea looking for QCD axion centered around Dijon. Uh, this, uh, the moduli field coming from string theory, if the SUSY breaking scale is low, can become dark matter as a coherent oscillating scale of field. Gravitino can also be a candidate for dark matter in this particular mass range. And as you can see, WIMP is a tiny range uh, uh, among these all, all possibilities. And I, uh, I, uh, I don't have time to talk about asymmetric dark matter today. Uh, topological defects is yet another interesting example. Uh, you can also have non-thermal production of WIMP-like particles. Stereo neutrinos is still one of the, the favorite candidates, which you can look for in X-ray satellites. And another example I'm going to briefly mention on, on the strong and interacting massive particle. And so uh, this is actually only a list of things I myself have worked on at some level. So there are many, more, many, many more possibilities I'm not even touching on. So there's a huge range of masses and huge range of theoretical possibilities. And that's what we're facing right now. So I can't do any justice in many, many ideas in the literature. But one thing I rather focus on today is this uh, uh, mass range here where the dark matter is in sort of a GeV kind of range, 
which corresponds to the energy scale of the strong interaction in the standard model. And what we know about the strong interacting particles is that they have large cross sections. And in the limit of sigma over m, I forgot m here, that roughly corresponds to one square centimeters per gram. This is a huge cross section. That's why this is a strong interacting particle. It turns out that this number is actually interesting from the point of view of galactic dynamics. So that's what I'd like to touch on, where the particle physics interest and uh, uh, the uh, Subaru uh, observation would actually sort of come together. So this is, has to do with this famous puzzle called core cusp problem, or too big to fail problem. So if you look at the galaxies, which are rather small and dim dwarf galaxies, which have rather a few number of stars in it, and you try to map out the velocity distribution of these stars, and so that you can infer the density uh, profile of, uh, uh, of the galaxy. And, and there has been this long-standing issue that, that doesn't seem to quite agree with dark matter only and body simulation, which predicts this kind of cusky behavior in the density profile, while observations suggest this kind of chord profile. So the, basically it's much flatter compared to the theoretical prediction. And it had been suggested over many uh, decades ago that uh, the some self-interaction among dark matter particles could actually resolve this, this issue. And, and this is actually interesting because so far the only evidence for dark matter we have is only based on the gravitational interactions. But if this is true, this is the first information we get on the nature of dark matter, namely they have to have some self-interaction of certain strength. So then we have made a, a huge progress in trying to understand the nature of dark matter beyond their gravitational uh, interactions. So that's why uh, this is a very interesting uh, question to ask. And the uh, self-interaction had been suggested already by uh, Sprogg and Steinhardt back in the year 2000. And, and it turned out that they only sort of uh, uh, played with it, didn't come up with a uh, uh, actual theory for it. So that's, that's the part where I play some role in it. But the main point here is that when you actually take the uh, kind of cross section you expect for GeV scale composite objects made of quarks and, and gluons, their size is roughly 10 to minus 13 centimeter. So this size of cross section is what is sort of expected for those particles when their mass is way somewhere between a few hundred MeV to a few GeV. So that's the coincidence. So in addition to the wind miracle we talked about, now we can talk about the, the scent miracle, the strong inter interacting massive particles seem to be actually relevant to this question. So this discrepancy between core profile and cuspy profile is what the self interaction can explain based on numerical simulation like this one. And in addition to this core cusp issue, there has been also not well understood issue about sort of the diversity of the mass distribution among many different dwarf galaxies. And uh, the Ayuki Ka uh, Kamada is actually a postdoc at Dijon in IBS. So he's in Korea right now, and he's one of my former students. And he actually came up with this uh, amazing analysis with the, uh, his collaborators. So this is where the self interaction seems to help as well. Of course, a lot of things about galactic dynamics and evolution is not fully understood. And, and main uncertainty there is what is called the baryonic feedback because the galaxies, after all, do have baryonic gas. So they have uh, actually inter interactions among each other. So you have to do hydrodynamic simulation of it. And they might form stars. And some stars go supernovae and explode and can, can, exp uh, uh, can uh, uh, um, uh, 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 the blow the masses away, for example. So uh, it, there's a lot going on in galaxies. So when you have a system which is rich in baryons, which correspond to very large galaxies, then baryonic feedback certainly cannot be uh, neglected. So it turns out that there had been measurements of this slope towards the center of galaxies among many, many different systems. And so the James Pollock and company pointed out that baryonic feedback might give you this Purple band so that it's not a big discrepancy from the data at the end of the day. So uh, we need to understand if this is true. So namely that we need to understand some chemical composition of a given galaxy so that you get some idea on how much supernova happened in a given system uh, uh, and, and versus the density profile and, and understand the correlation among them. So that's the kind of thing we need to study uh, in the future surveys. So the kind of survey I'm actually be talking about, it uses an instrument we're building right now called prime focus spectrograph, which can target at this really, really faint systems named ultra faint dwarfs, 
because it's a big aperture telescope, as I mentioned earlier, and, and so we get actually much uh, more insight into the spaciness as the survey goes on. So, so we talked about this WIMP miracle, but I just uh, pointed out that this is another miracle called SIMP miracle. So instead of two dark matter particles annihilating into stand, two standard model particles, you can also look for the process where three dark matter particles come together and annihilate into two dark matter particles, again, by reducing the num uh, moving number density this way. And clearly, for the three-body interaction to be important, you're talking about some kind of strong interaction. And as I mentioned already, we are talking about a mass scale of something like 300 MeV, so GeV scale, just like the strong interactions in a standard model. And once you put in this kind of strong coupling in it, it turns out that the cross-section you would expect for this process would lead to the correct abundance at the end of the day. So this is a different kind of miracle you get for the kind of coupling you expect for strong interaction, kind of energy scale you know about the strong interaction would lead to the right abundance at the end of the day. So that's the same miracle. And so in this case, we're talking about strong interacting system. So what I actually contributed to this area is that I propose that this is actually some kind of the strong interacting hadron-like particles made up of dark quarks and dark gluons. And then they can actually have finite size being bound state and therefore they have large cross sections and leading up to self interaction. So if you go through the, uh, the actual calculation, you'll find that the, for the mass of the dark matter, and, and this basically corresponds to coupling, you need to be on, along these solid lines if you have the, uh, would like to get the correct abundance. But at the same time, you need to be below this dashed line to satisfy the existing astrophysical limit on the self-interaction of the dark matter particles. And they are both satisfied in this range, which really corresponds to 300 MeV I mentioned earlier. So it can in principle work, and it's also interesting that the kind of self-interaction you would predict in this kind of theory is sort of up against the limit of the self-interaction cross-section. And uh, we also need to connect this dark uh, strong interacting sector, dark QCD, to the standard model. There are many different ways of doing so. This is the simplest example of something called the vector portal going through the kinetic mixing between their photon and our photon. But, but there are various other ways of doing the connection between the two sectors through axion and through Higgs. I, I think that the, uh, Hume Min Lee is actually part of uh, the audience today. So I collaborate with him on that. So, uh, so this is actually uh, uh, many different versions of the model of SIMS where you can get the correct phenomenology. So uh, can they actually explain this uh, uh, issue with the small scale structure in galaxies? So it turns out that if you look at the large systems, like clusters of galaxies, the upper limit on self-interaction cross-section is of the order of 0.1 square centimeter gram. It can be slightly higher. If you look at the smaller systems, like dwarf galaxies, then the kind of cross-section you would want, rather, is somewhere around one square centimeter squared, uh, uh, square centimeter gram. So this is uh, maybe a factor of three, three to order of magnitude difference between the two. So if you take this situation at the face value, it seems that you want to have large cross section in small systems where the dark matter particles moving slowly versus you'd rather want to have somewhat smaller cross section in larger systems where dark matter is moving faster. So that's a suggestion of velocity dependent self interaction cross section among dark matter particles. And, and to, uh, it's not that easy to build a particle physics model of this sort, unless you put in a new long range interaction, which is kind of bizarre. But it turns out that for this kind of strongly interacting particles, there's an easy solution to it, namely that dark matter may be interacting through a resonance. If that's the case, in system with large velocity dispersion, you may rarely hit this resonance, so cross section stays low. But in the systems where typical velocity roughly corresponds to the energy of this resonance, then you can hit the resonance pretty often and that would enhance the cross section. And that's the kind of curve I'm drawing here in orange. And depending on the parameter sets, you may have different behavior. But whole point here is that if you have this kind of resonance scattering, which we do see in nature in strong interacting systems, uh, then you can explain this velocity dependence of the self interaction cross section. And so this is just examples of various near threshold resonances we do see in the real world strong interaction data. Uh, we need a slightly better uh, uh, degeneracy compared to these numbers. 
And this is the famous example of uh, three-point alpha reaction in astrophysics for stellar fusion, uh, the stellar burning, uh, where you, you really need to have this very close threshold state in order for this uh, triple alpha reaction to proceed, often invoked as an example of anthropic principle. But anyway, so uh, these, uh, the near threshold resonances do exist in nature. And so uh, this is yet another way of seeing how these near resonant uh, threshold resonance do exist in the QCD data. And that's a paper uh, that is supposed to appear hopefully day after tomorrow. So these things can happen in strong interacting systems. And to test that idea, uh, again, we'd like to uh, in, uh, use super telescope. So right now we have this wide free corrector lens system, and then the CCD array is attached to it in this huge camera. I mentioned I, I showed a picture of that to you uh, uh, a few uh, uh, maybe ten minutes ago. So the idea is to swap out the array of CCD chips, but instead put in this uh, array of what we call the fiber positioners, cobras. Uh, they are little robots that can actually uh, 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 move the tip of the fiber optic cable around with a very good precision, like 10 microns in a very limited amount of time, so that each fiber gets uh, 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 pointed toward a particular astronomical object you would like to study. And, and once the, the optical fiber cable captures that photon, that gets routed to the, the next room where the spectrograph sits, and that covers the spectrum all the way from uh, near UV to near infrared, uh, and, and then the, you can get the spectra of uh, uh, roughly 2,400 uh, astronomical objects at the same time. So it's a very complicated system, but we've been building this uh, uh, since the, uh, about five years ago. So this is the wide field corrector lens system that already exists for HSC. And this is a demonstration of these copper or fiber positional system. That for each fiber is backlit, you see the photon coming out. Of course, in practice, you use the light goes into the fiber instead of coming out. But anyway, this is a demonstration that we can control the tips of these optical fibers with a very good precision within one minute or so. So then we can actually use it at 2400 of them to observe uh, that many uh, objects at the same time. And so that gets mounted into this fine focus instrument with the complicated instrument to relieve tension and, and has to actually point the uh, entire system correctly following the, the motion of the stars in the sky. And each optical fiber tip is mounted uh, with this, uh, 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 what we call the mini lens, because the F-ratio Subaru is 2.2, and we would worry about the, the lack of total internal reflection inside the fiber. So we glue this micro lens on, on, the, on the tip of each optical fiber cable to change the F-ratio to 2.6 or so, so that we would not lose any light uh, through about a 55 meters of optical fiber cable. This is how the optical fiber ca cables get connected. These are some of the optical elements, the dichroics and the lens for the uh, corrector lens for the camera in spectrograph. This is the when we are mounting the uh, the spectrograph uh, uh, together. This is putting the cryogenic system into the camera, and this is the metrology camera that have been already delivered to Subaru, actually built by the huge effort in Taiwan uh, by Asia A, and and this is some of the parameters of this instrument. So it covers all the way from 380 nanometers to 1260 nanometers. And we rely on Hamamatsu CCDs and the Teledyne Mercury Cadmium Telluride chips, uh, which is a kind of national security item. And, and so that's, that's the idea. Uh, so the one, uh, uh, two of the spectral modules have been already delivered Subaru. You can see how big they are. So uh, at the end of the day, we have uh, uh, 12 of these. Right now we have only two. And this is the way we actually package together many fiber optical cables into a, a single tube so that lighting it all the way from the tip of the telescope to this nearby room wouldn't create any tension on any piece of the fiber cable. And uh, this is the, the process of mounting into your car uh, device on the, onto the camera. And this is the, uh, the already about half of the, uh, the fiber position assistance mounted on the, uh, the, uh, on the bench so that this can be installed uh, into the uh, prime focus instrument. So this so is actually a pretty big collaboration. Yes? Oh, we lost some sound there. Um, so basically, oh. so as this experiment was running, basically it created some feedback and, and we, we lost what you said. Oh, this one. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So, you know, it, that, that is just a, the way of uh, putting the fiber cables together so that we can handle them without creating any tension in, in individual optical fiber. Okay, okay. Thanks. So that, that's what I was uh, supposed to be demonstrated by the video. Apologize for the sound. Okay. 
Okay, so this is really a fairly big collaboration, but only like 100 people. So these days that's considered to be modest size. And we're looking for more partners. I'm hoping that people in Korea also would get interested in this and joining together. And it can cover lots of science. And uh, it, it, they made, made, uh, basically three major pillars of surveys uh, we do with this instrument, cosmology survey, galactic archaeology survey, and galaxy evolution survey, touching on many, many different uh, science. Uh, so what, what I'm uh, mentioning right now is this galactic archaeology uh, uh, aspect of it. And, and using this uh, 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 the feature we built into this instrument, that you can actually change the, the, this, uh, the one of the three cameras, uh, the web camera, to have a higher uh, the spectrographic resolution going up to about 5,000 in resolving power. So that would allow us to measure the velocity of individual stars in these dwarf galaxies with a velocity resolution of something like three kilometers per second. So compared to the speed of light, this is 10 to minus five uh, in, the, uh, the, uh, 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 in, in the resolution. So this gives us very precise measurements of the velocity dispersion of stars in a given uh, dwarf galaxy that we can infer the density profile much more accurately. And then we can start testing these ideas about the small scale structure problems, core versus cusp, uh, diversity, and, and see if there is really a need for self-interaction of dark matter. So we plan to point at these dwarf galaxy systems, and one of them, Bootes one, is actually one, one is called, what is called outer dwarf systems. So outer dwarf means there are so few stars, so little baryons, that the dark matter completely dominates the dynamics of these systems. You don't expect much baryonic feedback in those systems. So if you do see a, a, a major disagreement uh, at a small scale structure in those systems, that would really point us to uh, uh, some interesting dark matter uh, phenomenology, such as the self-interaction I mentioned earlier. So, uh, so that's what we are trying to do with this instrument. And uh, uh, so I mentioned this. And so uh, the, the, right now the data are sort of scattered with very large error bars. So that's why we can't really tell if there is a discrepancy from the standard uh, NFW, like a dark matter simulation between the uh, and the data. So we can't really tell, but we will nail these uh, systems with much more error bars. And this is some the simulation we have done with the using the mod catalog uh, for the sculpture uh, the dwarf galaxies. And, and the point here is that you can really do the spectroscopy and measure the metallicity and alpha elements so that you get a much better idea on the age population of these stars and, and, and basically extract the chemical evolution history and understand if that is really what is consistent with what we expect from baryonic feedback. So that's the, the direction we'd like to head to. And it can actually be important for WIMPs as well, because one of the ways we look for the uh, indirect detection signature is to look for the uh, uh, gamma rays coming from dwarf galaxies. And to actually use dwarf galaxies as a site of the dark matter particles annihilating into standard model particles, we need to understand, again, density profile very well, because the rate of producing these gamma rays will be proportional to density squared so it's a very uh, 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 high sensitivity on the density profile of the dark matter. So once again, PFS would allow us to determine this density profile much better, much more accurately, so that we can get a much better uh, theoretical prediction on how much gamma rays you would predict. And by observing gamma rays, for example, Fermi satellite and forthcoming CTA survey, then you can extract the dark matter properties out of that. So this end gets a fix of PFS and Subaru. That's this end gets uh, fixed by the gamma ray observatories. And then you get some information on the dark matter in the middle by comparing the two. So that's the idea. And my uh, friends had been doing, again, very detailed studies on how well you can determine this dark matter profile for this purpose. And it looks actually very good. And in addition, there is also attention in the cosmological measurements by using the galaxy power spectrum to determine the omega matter and H naught. And H naught tension is often talked about, but it's actually a two-dimensional tension on the space of H naught and omega matter, it turns out. So, uh, and there's a tension between low redshift measurements and the high redshift measurements. 
and, and uh, uh, Subaru can also do this cosmology survey to map out this galaxy power spectrum, uh, also even going up to very high redshift of uh, like a two, which is not possible with a, uh, other existing survey projects that are running and, and about to run. So uh, this can map out really the high redshift, uh, get, uh, the amount of distribution versus low redshift one. So the PFS by itself can shrink the errors down to this level and see what's really going on. If there's a really tension between high redshift and low redshift or not, is something we're going to find using this PFS survey. Hitoshi, usually it's the yes. other way. Look at your top left plot. Usually it's the case that at high Z, H0 is lower. If we go back, right? So what's going on here? I mean, so Lambda C, Planck is giving a lower value, right? Then That's right, yeah. So you would expect it to be the other way around, right? It looks like your central value for Z greater than two is is bigger. Um, I'm, I'm tentatively confused. So this is the existing data, it's not the future data. Yeah, I'm, I'm and a bit... This is the current H naught band. So maybe I mislabeled them, uh, but this is Lyman alpha, so this should be high redshift. Yeah, exactly, I, I would agree with that, right? That looks fine. Yeah. Yeah, there's something, there's some, yeah. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't explain this right now. Yeah, so, so I, I see your point. So we often talk about the H0 tension uh, 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 for the high redshift versus red, low redshift. This, this uh, preferred region seems to go the other way. So that's the confusion here. And, and I don't have a clear answer right now. Um, uh, let's, let's come back and talk about this later. I'm sorry. Thanks. But anyway, the main point here is really the fact that the PFS would really uh, narrow this down uh, uh, using this uh, long level arm between the low redshift and the high redshift, thanks to the near infrared arm in the spectrograph. Now switching gear to visible matter. So as I mentioned earlier, so the, the question here is this asymmetry. So now that we see a beautiful agreement uh, on the measurement of the variant to photon ratio from CMB versus Big Bang nuclear synthesis, we are pretty sure that this is the right number, uh, which compares the, the measurement uh, uh, or, or totally different two errors in, in the area universe when it was only three minutes old versus 380,000 years old. So uh, this is a very non-trivial agreement. And the BBN measurement, of course, primarily comes from the deuterium abundance, which is possible uh, using this, uh, the, the Lyman absorption lines, using this uh, tiny difference in the spectrum lines due to the difference in the uh, reduced mass between the normal hydrogen uh, versus heavy hydrogen made of deuterium. So, so this is a very non-trivial measurement with very non-trivial agreement uh, between the CMB and the, uh, uh, the, the Big Bang nuclear synthesis theory. Uh, so that's something everybody, I, I believe, here knows. But the point here is that now that we know the number, uh, we know what should have happened in the universe uh, after inflation, namely that inflation turns into its energy density to the thermal bath by the reheating. And whenever the matter is created by, uh, from the energy, the matter and antimatter is created one to one. That's what we learned in grad school, uh, all of us. Uh, so the, the thing is that, uh, let's say uh, the inflation turned into a billion and one matter particles and a billion and one antimatter particles. We really need a process of reshuffling the amount of matter and antimatter so that they are now different at the level of two power in a billion. And much of them are either way and this is us, right? So that's the, that's the only way we can understand this number of the baryon to photon ratio. So we survived thanks to the, uh, at the expense of a billion friends, we have to be really grateful to them. But at the same time, we really need to understand this mechanism, how the matter and the antimatter could have been reshuffled uh, in the universe. And so that's where the, uh, the main paradigm today, I think it's fair to say, is that neutrinos play this role. So among the list of all elementary matter particles we know of, the neutrinos are the only ones that are electrically neutral. What we want is a antimatter particle to turn into matter particle. But if the particle is charged, that's not possible because of charge conservation. So only neutral particles can potentially do that. So if that's the case, then we all existence the neutrinos. And so this idea called leptogenesis is due to these two gentlemen, Tsutomi Yanagira and Masataka Fukida, who are uh, emeriti from the IPMU. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I'm very happy that, that they came up with this theory. And uh, so the, the real question is, do we ever know if this really is the case? 
So if that's true, then neutrinos saved us from company annihilation. So uh, uh, they are superheroes. So the, the reason why this kind of idea came about originally with the Anagira is, is this observation that the neutrinos are very light compared to other elementary particles. And uh, Korea is one of the countries that actually produced the evidence for theta 13, the neutrino mass mixing using reactor neutrinos. So uh, the neutrino mass had been firmly established by multiple experiments, solar neutrinos, atmospheric neutrinos, reactor neutrinos, and they are indeed very light. We know that. So there must be something special about the neutrinos uh, the, the, so that their masses do come out to be very light. And that's what is called the seesaw mechanism. So how do we understand that neutrino mass is so small? The one thing we have learned from experiments from nuclear beta decay is that every neutrino we have observed to date is left-handed. And this was okay as long as the neutrinos were massless because then they are going with speed of light all the time. Nobody can take over and look back at them. But now they do have a mass. They are not going with speed of light. So you can take over. And from your rest frame, neutrino is now going backwards. It looks like it's a right-handed particle instead. And nobody has observed such a particle yet. So that seems to raise some contradiction in this story. But it turns out that we know that the right-handed neutrinos may exist. And if you put that into the theory uh, in a standard model, you can write this usual Yukawa coupling, then you can generate the masses of these particles. But then you would expect these masses to be comparable to, to the, or the other elementary particle masses. Again, that seems to be a contradiction. So in terms of seesaw, the mass is too heavy. But it turns out that once you introduce this right-handed neutrino, you can work out that it doesn't seem to have any quantum numbers under the standard model gauge group. And therefore, it can have a very big mass independent of the electroweak scale. So you put a big mass term into this mass matrix. And once you diagonalize this mass matrix, then the smaller mass eigenvalue turns out to be suppressed by this uh, big mass scale M. So CISO goes the other way, and this particle becomes lighter. And that's the idea of the CISO mechanism. So if this is the idea, then the right-handed particle you have seen here by overtaking it turns out to be anti-neutrino. So then you see this possibility that the neutrino can connect matter to antimatter because it depends on the reference frame. So you can change matter particles into antimatter particles and it's actually own antimatter of its own and then it's called a Majorana fermion. So if you have this Majorana fermion, and these right-handed neutrinos I mentioned are very, supposed to be very heavy, but they could be produced in a very, very early universe when temperature is much, much higher than the electric scale. And once they're produced, they would of course eventually decay. And when they decay using this lowest order diagram, it can decay both into neutrinos and antineutrinos because there's no distinction between particle and antiparticle here. So that will give you 50-50 probability of getting leptons in the final state. But at the one loop level, you can have the interference between these two diagrams that can actually change the probability of this heavy right neutrino decaying into matter versus antimatter due to this interference term between three level and one loop diagrams, picking up the C3 violation in these uh, uh, Yukawa interactions. So then you have already implanted the difference in the amount of matter versus antimatter when these guys decay. So uh, this, I would say, is, it's fair to say that this idea became a dominant paradigm in neutrino physics. So it's interesting that the question, why do we exist at all, has to do with the tiny neutrino masses, but at the same time connected to very high energy, high temperature physics. But that is actually a, 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 a double-edged sword because uh, being connected to very high energy scale physics actually makes it notoriously difficult to test experimentally. So how do we ever know? Uh, the one thing I should mention is that once you actually do generate this asymmetry between lepton and anti-lepton, it can be converted to asymmetry between baryon and anti-baryons because of what is called electroweak anomaly process. So uh, if you solve the Dirac equation uh, in the early universe and you find these uh, negative energy solutions you have to fill, I have these positive energy solutions, you have to keep them open. But in the early universe before Higgs contains the universe, then W and Z bosons were massless. 
So they were fluctuating just like the electromagnetic field in thermal plasma, we know. And as the W and Z fields fluctuate, all of these negative energy levels go up and down. But if the fluctuation in W field becomes rather large, then all these energy levels might shift uh, fully by one unit. Then what used to be the particle occupying a negative energy state now sticks up above zero and occupies a positive energy state. And then you say, aha, there's a particle now. And this process would happen exactly the same way for every fermions that couple to W boson, namely every left-handed fermions, three colors of left-handed quarks and left-handed lepton. So they all change by the same amount. So if you start with a situation that you have finite lepton asymmetry, let's say this point is vacant, then it can actually move this way to, to make it filled. But if you do so, then quarks, which filled up to the zero energy, now stick above zero. Then you have populated three quark states, giving you one baryon number. So this thermal fluctuation of the W field can change the baryon lepton numbers the same way. And, and therefore, it can look for the equilibrium between lepton and baryon asymmetries. So once the right-handed neutrino decay implants a lepton asymmetry in the universe, then that can be converted to baryon asymmetry automatically by the electroweak interaction in the standard model. So that completes the story how we might end up with the baryon asymmetry so that we can exist today. And I don't go through this list, but the famous sufferers conditions, you can see that all conditions are satisfied in, in this uh, idea. But now comes the problem. If you actually do a more detailed calculations and determine what is the range of the right wing neutrino mass that can explain the amount of bearing asymmetry we need today, the range is from somewhere around 10 to 9 GeV to the 10 to 15 GeV. So that's a very heavy mass scale. And, and ideally, we'd like to build a future collider that might uh, go up to 10 to 14 GeV, that's this idea. And if you extrapolate the current technology to do so, and that ends up of galactic size, so that would truly require international collaborations, probably interplanetary collaboration to do so. So I'm not gonna see this in my lifetime. And that will be ultimate future circular collider. So the only thing we can hope to do uh, in the near future is what I call archeology. span So we can do the direct test, but we can look for so circumstantial evidences and that's what archaeology does. They dig up these fossils. They, don't, they are not recreating the history uh, in any way. But once you see many fossils lining up to tell you the same story, you start to believe in that story. So in the same way, you, if you see many circumstantial evidences, and I mentioned one of them is called neutrino stability decay, but also CP violation, neutrino oscillation, that's a big thing uh, about to happen both in Japan and in the United States. And, uh, uh, and also other potential impacts on the lepton flavor violation and their experiments again happening in a Fermilab and uh, J-Park in, in Japan. And so then, then we, we can do actually this kind of archaeology. But as you can see, the more circumstantial evidences there are, the better. So what could be another possible circumstantial evidence? That's the question I was asking. And then one of them actually has to do with the PFS again. So problem, we're looking for this new sensible beta decay is that as far as the current data goes, its matrix element, which is a combination of masses and mixing angles, can in principle be zero, even if you have this property that the neutrinos are Majorana particles. Then you may never know. So what you're looking for in universal beta decay, let's say xenon has many neutrons in it, and the one neutron wants to do a double beta decay are going into electron and then and the antineutrino, and this is the barium, uh, sorry, the uh, um, cesium. But this cesium nucleus tends to be heavier than the original xenon nucleus, so this is not energetically allowed. But if you have another neutron undergoing beta decay at the same time, then the final daughter nucleus would be barium, and that can be lighter than xenon, so this process is now allowed by energy conservation. And so the, that's why this is double beta decay producing two electrons. But if the neutrino is a Majorana particle, then this emitted antineutrino may appear as a neutrino from the point of view of the other neutron, 
then you can absorb it and then emit an electron without any neutrinos emitted from this process. So that's why this is the zero neutrino, neutrino less double beta decay. And this matrix element is really proportional to the amount of flip between matter and antimatter now, that's a vertical axis and it can be zero, as I said, and that would be a problem. But point here is that PFS can also uh, measure the, oh, the sum of the neutrino masses by looking at this galaxy power spectrum. And so this is the level of the accuracy we expect so that you can actually draw a line like this at the end of the day, if we are lucky. And if you know that you are on this line, then you can constrain that this matrix element has to be bigger than this number. And then you compare that to the, uh, 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 the experimental data and then falsify this idea that the neutrinos are Majorana. So the combination of this cosmological measurements from galaxy power spectrum together with underground experiment of neutrinos of beta decay can in principle falsify this idea of leptogenesis. And one thing uh, I also produced lately, which doesn't have with the PFS, so I, let me go through very quickly, is this, this idea that the right hand neutron mass seems to be much lower than the Planck scale. Therefore, it is well, presumably generated by some kind of phase transition a la Higgs mechanism of the electric weak theory. So new symmetry gets broken at some high scale, and then the right hand neutron mass is induced by the coupling to its Higgs. And, and um, when that phase transition happens, it turns out that it's quite likely that the cosmic strain network uh, emerges out of the phase transition, and we can expect gravitational wave signal. So it turns out that when we actually did this analysis together with these people, it's now published in PRS, one of the editor's suggestion, it turns out that out of eight possible theoretical scenarios of the symmetry breaking, five of them ends up producing this network of cosmic strings. And then you expect the level of gravitational wave uh, signal corresponding to the symmetry breaking scales. And the range from 10 to 9 to 10 to 15 GeV, as I mentioned, is the, the range relevant for this leptogenesis idea. And in various combination of the uh, current and future missions may actually observe the stochastic gravitational wave coming from this. So it basically covers entire energy region expected in this leptogenesis and scenario. So this is actually quite exciting. And so these are my collaborators on this uh, work. And I also did additional work with the uh, Wilfred Buchmiller and company. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and the idea is that they had this particular scenario of the hybrid inflation. And this watershed direction actually ends up producing this uh, uh, the, the, the phase transition that induces the, the right hand neutrino mass. And for the inflationary phenomenon to work out, they actually need a very high energy scale for this phase transition which turned out to be nominally excluded uh, by the gravitational wave signal at the pulsar timing array already. But it turned out that you can actually break these uh, the cosmic strings by the pair production of magnetic monopoles if they exist. So that's a sort of dual version of the Schwinger uh, process in the electromagnetism. So if that happens, then the strings get cut at some point. And so that what you would be nominally excluded spectrum of the gravitational wave coming from cosmic strings by the proposal timing array may be okay if this tunneling phenomenon of pair creation of magnetic uh, uh, monopoles would cut the string to remove this lower frequency portion of the uh, nearly scale invariant spectrum of the gravitational waves. So this idea of a uh, very nice idea by these people on hybrid inflation turns out to be consistent with the current PTA limit and if that's the case, even the LIGO could have a sensitivity to this uh, gravitational wave signature uh, proving the right-handed neutrino mass scale. So that's something uh, I'm very much looking forward to. Finally, uh, this is the subject of this lecture series, Dark Energy. So you, you all know it started with this uh, measurement of the accelerating expansion universe, but using the uh, type 1a supernova, and it suggests the cosmological constant to be something like 126 orders of magnitude smaller than the Planck scale. And that seems to call to a very, very fine tuned universe. Uh, it's, it's much, much smaller than the size of the tick over here. And that's why uh, a lot of discussions went into this anthropic principle and multiverse and so on and so forth. So, and that got even magnified by this idea of the string theory landscape. So if there are many, many minima 
uh, in the landscape of the string theory potential energy, and in each uh, uh, local minimum has some finite vacuum energy, we may end up with any one of them. And if one of them ends up having accidentally tiny vacuum energy, that's the universe we live in. And, and so that's a, a, a possible scenario indeed uh, coming out of string theory to explain this accelerating expansion of the universe. But if that's the case, then the dark energy is a pure cosmological constant and, and we may never know that any observational efforts would be futile uh, because we are not going to see any uh, interesting uh, effect on the evolved time evolution of dark energy uh, at the future collider uh, cosmology missions. And so to, uh, I actually got to put together some TV show with a Japanese broadcaster explaining the so that's the idea of the string theory landscape. And, and a friend of mine, Hiroshi Ogui, as many of you know, came up with this sort of counter argument to this called the Swampland conjecture. So even though the cosmological constant can be part of the low energy effective field theory, so that you can just write a field theory to account for this effect, not all low energy effective field theories can be lifted to string theory. And this uh, co-set is actually what they call the swamp plant. And they claim that those theories that can be lifted to string landscape cannot have a local minimum with a positive energy density. So negative energy density anti the space is okay, but the resistance space is not. So if you are living in finite energy density, then it needs to have a slope so that it's not a minimum. And, and so uh, it's still controversial, but this is actually interesting because this positive vacuum energy or cosmological constant is now in swamp plan. It cannot be lifted the string theory. And, and if that's true, then the dark energy has to evolve as a function of time. And if this constant C is really order one, as they say, then the equation state has to deviate from minus one. Therefore, that becomes a target of the future galaxy surveys. And uh, uh, so the idea is that anti little space is okay. Minkowski space is okay, but the little space is not. So it has to be something like a quintessence time evolving dark energy. So that's what they said in their paper. And the one thing uh, that caught my attention immediately is that, you know, if this were really what's going on in string theory, that you can connect string theory directly to low energy EFT, you have to go through supergravity. So is it possible that given that we know supersymmetry is badly broken by the lack of LHC data, that SUSY particles are heavier than TV and so on, can it really give you such a flat potential? And with my former student Chen Yi Chan, we actually came with a, a general prescription on how to write a supergravity Lagrangian for basically any potential you like to be connect to connect the string theory low energy limit to the uh, uh, quintessence as a low energy effective field theory. So at least it can be done. But at the same time, we realized that something strange with the Swampland conjecture, because it forbids also a local maxima, uh, the way it was formulated. Then, then even the standard model turns out to be in swamp land. And so something's wrong with that. Many models of beyond the standard model also seems to be in swamp land. If the grading has to be order one, the slow roll condition of, of inflation is not satisfied. So even the inflation seems to be in swamp land. So something has to give. So together with Masahiro Yamazaki and Tsutomi Yanagida, we, we uh, suggested that maybe the original version was too strong. So you have to modify it. And our suggestion was, well, if the, the potential is concave up, then you don't need to satisfy this condition. Only when the, uh, the, the potential has a, a, a positive uh, second derivative, you need to apply this condition they propose. That was our suggestion. But they are so ambitious that they came up with actually stronger proposal. So they put in a condition of second derivative to be also order one. 
relative to the size of the potential. So they revised their uh, 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 the, uh, the conjecture to accommodate all these issues we pointed out. So if this is the case, then in principle, you can have, for example, this uh, the, 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 the inflation theory with two different sections of the potential. One section is satisfied by this uh, uh, the, the uh, first derivative constraint. Second section is satisfied by this uh, second derivative constraint. Then it can have uh, inflation consistent with this kind of a uh, swampland conjecture. At the same time, we have seen that there is still a hope of observing W to be significantly different from one, which we can do at the PFS galaxy survey down to the level of 0.1 or one or so. And potentially, Lightboot, that's another mission IPM has been pushing for, which is now approved by JAXA, to probe the, the tensor to scalar ratio down to 0.001, the tensor minus three. Uh, uh, so the, uh, there is a chance of observing that tensor component as well. So, so this is uh, an interesting uh, 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 exercise we have done. Given this revised swampland conjecture, do we still, uh, are, are we still motivated to do this uh, galaxy survey on PFS, looking for evolution of the dark energy, and also look for the tensor, the scalar ratio uh, in terms of CMBB mode in the future CMB missions? And fortunately, answer turns out to be yes. So this is how well you can do a totally model independent determination of dark energy density as a function of redshift going way beyond the kind of redshift range DESI can do because of the near infrared and the deep exposure of the 80 meter telescope. So this is how well you can see how dark energy has been evolving as a function of time. And if there's something unusual, like early dark energy or some people favoring from the h naught tension, maybe that can show up in, in this measurement. So uh, it's, we are uh, uh, even more motivated than we, we started. So let me finish up my talk with this uh, promotion video for PFS. So you're looking for these photons coming accidentally heading towards a galaxy from a uh, uh, hybrid chip. And it's really a miracle that uh, these photons end up finding our solar system. For some reason, planets are lined up and they eventually find this uh, big island of Hawaii and find this big aperture telescope. That's why big aperture is very important to capture them all. And you tune this position of these optical fibers using these robots to make sure that they get into the fiber cable. And we route this fiber cable are 50, 50, 55 meters from the other room that gets fed into a close spectrograph each with the three arms for red, blue, and yellow and red. And these spectral lines tell us about the chemical compositions and motions, peculiar motions, and so on and so forth. So that's how we would like to do the survey, hopefully starting in early 2023. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, so it's now open for questions or comments. Let me see if, uh, does anybody online have a question? Or a comment? Oh, that's unfortunate. That's usually a bad sign. <laughs> Actually, I, I, let, me, let me ask you a question, Hitoshi, then. Um, okay, go ahead. Uh, so basically, this whole left genesis relied on it being Majorana, right? So the hierarchy may be different. Um, can you say anything there? Um, so if it's Dirac, then you have to, uh, you, you, you can write leptogenesis-like theory even when the neutrinos are Dirac. I, I actually did that with Aaron Pierce. But mm -hmm. I would say it's not as natural as this model. It's definitely not minimal. You have to impose more symmetries to make sure that theory has the right structure and so on and so forth. So even though I did propose such a theory before, this simpler version with Majorana is, I would say, much, much better. So uh, the, I think the leptogenesis as a whole, it really does prefer Majorana neutrinos. Thanks. It looks like Armin has a question. Hello. Uh, thanks, Hitoshi, for you know, spending your time with us. Um, so My I pleasure. have a question. Yeah, um, about the strategic plan of the PFS. Um, have you guys thought how PFS would compete with DESI and Euclid? As we know that these guys would be ahead of PFS and uh, particularly for the cosmology purpose, you know, you talked about dark mm -hmm. energy, dark matter. So mm -hmm. PFS has any strategy, you know, changing paths, you know, to, to be able to do something which the others cannot do or if there is a big fish to catch? 
Yeah, so the answer is actually fairly simple. So uh, as I said, PFS is not just cosmology, but does all kinds of other things, including galactic archaeology I emphasize today. So, uh, and they, they, we share something like 360 nights among these three science objectives. So we are now talking about actually front-loading cosmology portion of the survey and back-loading galaxy evolution survey. And, and that's also uh, makes sense scientifically because galaxy evolution survey does require good sensitivity at the high redshifts and therefore instrument needs to perform at its best. So we have to tune it until we will be able to actually do so. While cosmology has much uh, weaker uh, requirements on instrument performance, so we can start early. So if we do start early, uh, given that the cosmology survey goes at a rate, which is roughly speaking four to five times faster than DAISY does, because you no know, eight meter telescope captures four times more light than four meter telescope, that's a really factor of four, we can actually catch up. So DAISY has a head start by two years, let's say, but cosmology survey gets front loaded within five to six years of survey for this entire program. So cosmology portion would actually be happening much, much quicker than the rest of the surveys at the beginning, so we can catch up. So by the time that DAISY starts to produce a, uh, some of the early results, the PFS gets already started because this kind of analysis actually takes uh, uh, quite, quite a bit of years. Uh, you, you know that DES produced the first year of data only sitting on data uh, after like two years or so. So this is actually a very difficult thing to do. So the data rate would not necessarily translate to how fast we can put out the science. Once the data gets accumulated and, and catch up with the DAISY, then we can do science, I hope, also on a competitive time scale. So that's the, the strategy we have right now. Thanks so much. Hello. Hello. Hello, I have a question. Okay, please. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm Christian, okay? I have one question. I, I cannot hear you very well. I'm sorry, what did you say? I have a question, okay? Yes, please. Okay, you are talking on both interacting or strong interacting with some dark matter. Something like dark blue or dark my question is, if the test case of the safe interaction, the galaxy, galaxy collision, will be slight change from present like sea flow, like if there's some kind of sticking, something like that, is that changing? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So as a matter of fact, the reason why we have these uh, uh, plots here. That uh, the, the uh, cluster of galaxies prefer lower cross section or even none in some cases is because of the collision of the cluster of galaxies, for example, bullet cluster. So there's a limit coming from those systems after the collision of galaxies or cluster of galaxies that limit the self-interacting cross section to be below square centimeters per gram. And depending on analysis, some analysis are much more uh, 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 aggressive going down to 0.1 square centimeter per gram. So you're absolutely right. Knowing the systems uh, that, that uh, 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 you can study after the collisions between galaxies, the cluster of galaxies, you do get an upper limit on the self interaction cross section. But it turns out that that upper limit is still comparable to the kind of number you need for dwarf galaxy systems. Maybe there's a tension, and if there's a tension, you rely on this kind of velocity dependence of the cross section. So that's exactly right. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the question. Hitoshi, can I ask you a question about that then? Um, basically, so the motivation here was uh, the cost problem, right? So self-interacting dark matter helps with this. Mm -hmm. Would you the missing satellite problem, which may or may not be a problem anymore. Um, no, probably not. But I mean, does self-interacting dark matter have some signature there in terms of satellites? Um, so my understanding, uh, talking to people like, uh, uh, oops, I, the name escapes me now. I'm getting old. Uh, anyway, so I, I talked to a few uh, uh, simulators who do the numerical simulations of dark matter uh, profile. Uh, tell me that self-interaction actually doesn't solve 
the, uh, the uh, missing satellite problems. Uh, in other words, even if you do have the self-interaction, that you don't raise some of these uh, uh, substructures. So, uh, uh, so that seems to be the, the, the way the simulation is converging these days. So uh, in some sense, not having missing satellite problem is not in conflict with the self-interaction. Any more questions or comments? Uh, hello, uh, may, I, may I ask a question? Uh, Please. Yes, hello, uh, Professor Mur uh, Muramem. Uh, I'd, like I'd like to ask a question about the uh, gravitational wave signature coming from okay. the, I like, the like testing new system mechanism using mm -hmm. relying on the gravitational wave. And um, uh, I'd like to ask a question about what would be the distinguished feature for the gravitational wave coming from uh, some model accommodating system mechanism, uh, yeah, which can help you distinguish this gravitational wave is really coming from some model, you know, accommodating system mechanism other than the other model. Like there are, there are tons of BSM models which predict the, which predict the production of gravitational wave. And, um, and in order to distinguish the gravitational waves coming from different models, like that potentially arise from different BSM models, there might be, uh, I, like if, if it would be better for, for this model to have some distinguished feature for gravitational wave, which is unique, uniquely imprinted from gravitational wave coming from this model, like this model, uh, for, for example, you want to be sale. Like, do you have some distinguished feature in this gravitational yeah, wave? Yeah, so, so uh, it, it's not a full answer, I apologize, but part of the answer, namely that if you have a source of gravitational wave coming from some astrophysical sources, like a merger of the supermassive black holes, that's what Lisa is after, then they, they have a sort of characteristic range of the frequencies. That's what Lisa was designed for, for instance. Sure, yeah. And uh, if you also have the first sort of phase transition leading up to the stochastic gravitational wave background, I don't seem to have the plot with me right now, but that also has this kind of sort of characteristic frequency for that. And that's okay. why we, we often say that electroweak baryogenesis has signature in the Lisa range. That's mm -hmm. because the coincidence between the frequency you would expect for a given energy scale of the phase transition to the frequency where emission is sensitive to. The, what's really special about the cosmic string origin of gravitational mm -hmm. wave is this near scale invariance because the network cosmic string keep just simplifying themselves and behave in some sense a self-similar system like in the Ising model critical temperature. So uh, that, that's why you get this plateau of the stochastic oh. gravitational wave over many, many decades. So this will be far in the future, but if you have many different missions and many different techniques that can map out the wide range of the frequencies in stochastic gravitational wave and observe this plateau, that is pretty much a smoking gun signal for the cosmic string origin of yeah, the gravitational wave. Okay, yeah, thanks for the answer. But, but then I would ask, I would ask whether this plot you like feature is this is still not the unique feature of, for example, U on B minus L or other other model which which accommodate the system model. But but I'm asking the question about the is there any unique feature of model accommodating system model, like? Yeah, yeah. So that that's why I say it was a partial answer, and I don't okay, have a yeah, answer oh, I see, I see, I see, that I see. part of your question. No, I don't. I see. I see. I see. But, I see. Okay. but interesting thing though is that once you see a signal, confirm it's scale invariant. Mm -hmm. So now you, be, you believe that's cosmic string. Then oh, this, see, uh, the si size of the okay. signal would okay. correlate to the phase transition temperature. I see. And then you would predict also both edges of the uh, cosmic string, uh, sorry, the gravitational wave signal. So see, see. once you see that this height and edge are consistent, mm -hmm. then that's a strong evidence for uh, the uh, cosmic string. But suppose they don't, then you're talking about this weird phenomenon of the B minus cell string getting cut by monopole production. And that, that means that the group is embedded into some kind of grand unified theory. And this is actually on top of uh, looking at the string at uh, the, uh, the, the leptogenesis scale, it's even as good an evidence for grand unification as proton decay, I would say. I see, uh, okay. So, and, and so then you start seeing okay, some, see. yeah then you start Sorry. seeing some kind of the symmetry breaking pattern, again, in the spirit of archeology, span giving you consistent story 
And that's what the Stephen King and company did recently by combining information coming from uh, the proton decay and gravitational wave to what extent you can pin down on a particular symmetry breaking pattern. I see. Uh, so this observation of uh, the scale invariance for the high frequency, this, this may help greatly you to, yeah, rule out yeah, your various models. Okay, I see. Right, and, right, and right. May, yeah, may I ask one further question about why this kind of scale invariance occurs for, for that frequency range, like from like those frequency range greater than one hertz? One, yeah, one gigahertz, yeah. Yeah, so, so when yeah. the uh, network of strings are produced initially, then yeah. that would correspond to a very high frequency. And, but then the, the string has an energy proportional to length. So if you have rather complicated network, then string has overall a long length, oh, which comes with cool. energy cost. So string wants to shorten itself by simplifying its network. And, but okay. as it's trying to shorten itself, more strings come into the horizon from the neighboring horizon as the universe slow down. I so see. you keep getting more infusion strings as time goes on. It keeps simplifying it, but it gets more infusion at the same time. So that's why it becomes self-similar at the end uh, of the day. Okay. And that's the origin of this nearly scale invariant spectrum. I see. Uh, then I understand. Yeah, yeah. This is really a unique feature for, for the gravitational wave coming from the collision of cosmic strings, I see. Uh, right, doing. right. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. Okay, any more questions or comments? So there's none here. And okay, if not, then we can thank our speaker again. So thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Okay, thank you for your attention.